Hello and welcome to Let's Talk, a series of podcasts produced by the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation on issues related to substance use prevention, research, treatment, and recovery from addiction to alcohol and other drugs. My name is William Moyers. I'm your host for today, and I've worked for Hazel and Betty Ford for the past 23 years. But before that, I was a patient in 1989 and 1991, and so I know about these issues both professionally and personally. And I certainly know about the issues as they relate to our topic today and our guest, Brenda Eiliff. Brenda is the executive director of our operation in Florida, down in Naples specifically. Mm -hmm. And today, Brenda is here to share with us her expertise on addiction and treatment issues in the 50 plus population, yes. meaning those who are older than 50 years old. Why is that an issue? Well, as, as people age, we become at greater risk for chemical use, misuse, and abuse. You know, we know that young people are, are at greater risk because of the developing brain, mm -hmm. but we don't talk about much that as we age, also we're at, at increased risk. In fact, there's estimates that about 17% of people 50 and above have a, a chance of chemical use, misuse, or abuse. And the reason for that, just like with the young people, it's about physiologically, the brain is different with the young people. With older people, physiologically, the way we metabolize the chemicals are very different. So that one or two drinks that we've had our whole life with no problem, really, mm -hmm. all of a sudden the body starts to slow down and that one or two drinks can become like four or five in our systems and then we might be retiring and we might have trouble sleeping or we might have anxiety or we might have losses or we might have our hip replaced and get on pain pills so people are at much greater risk as they age. Is there a stigma around addiction in older adults? Oh yes, How absolutely. So? Um, we are really talking about two different groups. One would be the traditionalists, the older, older adults, and there's a huge stigma there because think about that. Those are folks that were growing up during Prohibition, mm -hmm. and so it was really very much a moral issue for those folks. And then the baby boomers, those are folks who were sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and they're not opposed to going back to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times there's the stigma of, how could this happen to me? I've had a whole life of wonderful life, and now the chemicals are causing a problem? Hmm. You know, it's interesting, the baby boom generation um, was born between 1946 and 1964, mm -hmm. and that was the first generation that really had recovery as an option, because mm -hmm. Alcoholics Anonymous was only founded in the late 1930s, and so suddenly baby oh, boomers, okay. um, a subset of those baby boomers came of age in recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they had an avenue out of their hopelessness. They had an avenue Absolutely. out of their addiction and recovery. So there's certainly a lot of us, I'm being one of them, um, who's been in recovery and is now getting older. What is it that older adults, um, particularly older adults who are already in recovery, what do we have to watch out for as we get older? In oh, recovery. wow. There's, oh, that's a great question, William. There's several things that we've seen. You know, at, at Hazleton, um, Betty Ford in Naples, half the people we work with are 50 and older. Half. So we're mm -hmm. seeing a lot of people who are entering into treatment at a little bit later in life. They might even have years of recovery, and then they move or they retire. And AA is not the same as it was in Cleveland mm -hmm. or Texas or Minnesota or whatever. And so they start to get a little complacent because I don't really belong. So people really need to watch out for resting on their laurels, if you, if you will. Um, but they also need to watch out for medications. Um, as people age, you know, we have our hips fall apart, our knees fall apart or whatever. And people are exposed to medications that they may not have been exposed to before, such as the pain pills, the benzodiazepines, the anxiety pills, and that can bring people back into addiction also. The role that we have is recovering people who are getting older in recovery. We, we have a responsibility to let our doctors know this, don't we? We do, we do. And not only that, but we have a responsibility for what we put in our mouths. Because you may hear from a doctor or a healthcare provider, you need this for the pain, and you might, but you might not need it for three months. You might need it for three days or one day. 
So we have the responsibility to talk to people who know about medications in recovery too, because the benzodiazepines and the opiates are highly addictive. What would be an example of a benzodiazepine, for example? Um, a sleeping pill. Sleeping pill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or an anxiety pill. Mm -hmm. And you know, as people get older, the anxiety does increase because just like everything else slows down in our, in our bodies, so do those chemicals in our brain. Mm -hmm. So people are more susceptible to anxiety, to depression. Um, the serotonin's not working as well in, for many folks, so. You talked about um, uh, opioids or pain medication, and of course we know, we've chronicled it in, uh, in these podcasts, and we see it every day at Hazel mm -hmm. and Betty Ford, the impact that opioids or pain medication have had on the population. We have an epidemic. How has that epidemic manifested itself in the population that you work with? Hugely. In the, in the county that Hazelton Betty Ford is located in, half our overdoses are people that are older but we don't talk yeah. about it. We talk about the people that are younger. Those are the people that are hitting the papers, you know, the opiate yes. epidemic. But we've got a lot of people who are older who are dying. Usually though what's different is there's alcohol in the system and there's benzos in the system. So they're mixing all three. Yeah, absolutely. There's a trifecta. Oh. And you know, we get a lot of, um, I mean, thank goodness we're getting a lot of information about the opiate epidemic, but generally we need to talk about the addiction mm -hmm. epidemic that we're mm -hmm. facing. So how do we treat older adults, 50 plus? It's hard to believe that we talk about 50 plus being an older adult, but that's the reality. How do, what's the treatment modality? How do we approach treatment for somebody who's older? For example, they might be in a wheelchair, they might have some cognitive issues, mm -hmm. Um, they might be set in their ways. How do we do it? We do it the same way we do with everybody else. Really? Yeah, looking at, at holistically what does this person need. So first off, we're going to make sure that they get a safe detox because detox goes a little bit slower as people age. Oh. So and we want to make sure they get a safe detox. But then we need to look at their needs. What are their medical needs? What are their mental health needs? What are their addiction needs? A lot of the pieces of, of treatment for someone who's older that we find so helpful and they just eat it up is education. Mm -hmm. Learning about what happened, what <laughs> happened? How did a 61-year-old right. like me who's had a full life cross the line into addiction? Yes. So these are folks that are very responsive to learning more about addiction and learning more about, about the solution which we believe is the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times with the older, older, older adults, those are folks who've had purpose in their life. So it's just helping them get back to some sort of purpose. With the boomers, sometimes they're still searching for purpose. Mm -hmm. They've never found it. Mm -hmm. But what more can really be helpful for people is connecting them with others, finding a purposeful and meaningful life through the 12 steps. So let's talk about the family for just a minute here. I've, I know that I've had many adult children come to me and say, you know, my mother or my father isn't right. Uh, Dad's retired and he's playing golf every day and we want him to play golf, but he's coming home tipsy at five o'clock or mom's lost her husband of 65 years and so mm -hmm. she's filling that void with a little bit of alcohol. On the one hand, we don't see anything wrong with that, but on the other hand, something's going on here. Talk about how what would be the advice to an adult child? Well, uh, obviously start with empathy, dignity, and respect, you know. I wouldn't use the words alcoholic or addict. I'd oh. stay away from those words totally. Um, generally, with the older, older adult, um, things that can be really helpful are c tying it back to independence. Yeah. So, Dad, I'm worried about all your falls. You know, we, if you want to stay independent, we have to do something about your falls. Could we talk to somebody about how alcohol or the benzos might be affecting your falls? Also tying it back to health issues can be really helpful. Mom, I'm worried about your diabetes. We're not getting, we're not getting your diabetes under control. I'm wondering if we can talk to somebody about how the drinking impacts your diabetes, but clearly stay away from labeling words like alcohol and alcoholic. What's your response, though, to those adult children who say, you know, it's too late, dad's 80 Absolutely years old, not. mom Absolutely. is 86? You know, some of the myths of, of, of aging and the myths of addiction are they're too old, they won't change, let them enjoy their life. When, when we're talking with people that have crossed the line, they're not enjoying life anymore. Mm -hmm. They're falling, they're hurting themselves, they're isolating. Um, one of the 
the key pe things that I've seen really motivate people is getting them back to enjoying their life. And it, a lot of times one of the differences for older adults is it can be a minimal intervention. Uh -huh. It doesn't have to be, I mean, if they're lucky and they can come to Hazleton Naples or, or Hazleton Betty Ford and any of our sites, good for them. But a lot of times a conversation with the clergy can do it. Just educating about the effects of the drugs or a conversation with the health care provider can do it. It doesn't, a lot of times, a minimal intervention can do a lot with an older adult. So then you touch on something that um, I hadn't even thought about, which is the importance of education around these issues in the community at large, be it in the medical field or in the church or in the mm -hmm. civic association, right? You do some of that community work, we too. We do. We do some education through Hazleton Betty Ford um, with, with about older adults. and. Um, but it's important to, to, to look at all the people that influence this person's life. Like the person that may spot it is a home health care person, oh, or yes. the trash person, or the neighbor, oh. or the parish nurse. You know, it's not just the typical, um, we think the families are going to see it. In fact, many times the families don't see it because they're living all over the country, sure. you know, right. um, and mom and dad are retired in Florida. so. Who might be? We, we go out and we educate sometimes social communities, some of the older adult retirement mm. villages where social hour starts at noon sometimes, and there are some real problems there. I know you've been open in your writings and in your teachings and your lectures about being a woman uh, in recovery and also an, a woman who is a 50 plus, Yeah, just like yeah. I'm a 50 plus. I wanted just to end our podcast by having you share a little bit about how your perspective on your journey has evolved through these years and through these decades. How do you see recovery today compared to when you found recovery 20 some odd years ago? Oh, it's so, you know, they, they say the road narrows and the road gets broader. I, it, it, you know, it, I, at first it was about staying sober, now it's about living life, a life beyond my wildest dreams. And I get to, I mean, to think that I can watch women, men, older adults, younger adults, find recovery, what a gift. So. Well, thank you, Brenda, for sharing your life um, with us today and your thank life you. in the communities that you thank live you. in and that you work in. Brenda Eiliff, the Executive Director of Hazel and Betty Ford's Operations in Naples, Florida. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And thanks to all of you, our, our constituents at the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation for tuning in to another edition of Let's Talk. On behalf of our executive producer, Lisa Stangle, I'm William Moyers, and we hope you'll join us again for Let's Talk, a series of podcasts on the issues that matter to Hazel and Betty Ford and matter to you, too.